So it's not incredibly important or even germane to know what led me to the conversation and the pondering. I have to defer from describing exactly who I was talking to and in what context. But the question that rose out of the conversation, now that's interesting. And the question was, how hard would it be to make VCRs again? This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. To the best of my knowledge, nobody is making VCRs anymore. There might be what's called new old stock, where some warehouse in Argentina or Brazil, the result of some bad business deal, some contract falling through, and then somebody just has a lot of extra stock that they never quite figured out what to do with. But the actual manufacturing of the tape mechanism and the helical scan heads that are required to read a VCR, nobody's making those anymore. Somebody had mentioned to me a question they were asked about, is there a way, for fun, for a interesting gimmick, to release something on videotape, and with it, have a videotape player? Maybe even a VCR that would play other VHS tapes and survive as a fun and nostalgic way to play all of these old tapes. If blockbusters or video stores represent an emotional base for you, a historical moment that you were proud to be part of, either as a owner or a consumer, the draw of having some sort of equipment reimagined in the modern era that would just work is very alluring. My immediate reaction, however, was complicated. On one level, I definitely thought it would be smarter to do what the band Cheap Trick does, which is buy old 8-track tapes, write over them with their albums when they release them, and then release a very limited edition of your album on this old medium. In this way, you're not trying to ramp up any sort of manufacturing, any sort of relearning of old, incredibly hard-to-find lore. There have been, over the years, many attempts to bring back some sort of old equipment, often some old brand, and bring it back in a way that attracts the attention of people who remember that brand from their childhoods or early adulthood and convince them to buy whatever this brand has been slapped onto. But it's ranged over time. One particular example is the Commodore brand, where a small amount of MP3 players and audio players had the Commodore logo, bought from a Necro brand, and provided to you mostly as a way to skin other equipment. Nothing there ever touched the hand of a Tremail, Nothing there ever came from the original Commodore. It was just an interesting skin, an interesting reference to something before. Other times, we've seen attempts to bring back a brand in the actual equipment that it was known for. For example, the Bolex camera, where an electronics company licensed the name with permission from the family and attempted to bring back a certain kind of camera that would do justice to the Bolex name. And I'm not even going to go down the rabbit hole of apps that ended up acting like a piece of equipment that has some sort of meaning to people. For example, a Tascam 4-track recorder, which became an iPad app and, frankly, a reference more than any other use as a tool. So, going back to VCRs, there's a complication in my thoughts about it because... It was something I was thinking about for years. We have a problem when it comes to VHS tapes. There's a lot of them, and there's not as many machines as there used to be. 
Not only are there not as many machines, but even within the pool of machines, there's different opinions as to which ones are really good and which ones are just getting by. Right now, I'm moving between three different kinds of VCR, and frankly, I can see the difference. Some of them have different chips to deal with problematic signal. Some of them were focused for a certain kind of use, and they do that use very well. But putting in a consumer-grade VHS tape doesn't always work. But also, there's an incredible amount of proprietary technology behind them. Chips that change how the signal looks once it comes off the tape. Chips that compensate for a weak signal or being recorded under some sort of additional feature that people didn't even know was being done. And in all of these cases, the VCR basically has a set size. The mechanism inside, manufactured as it was by JVC or Sony or Magnavox or any of a number of brands, were a combination of internationally accepted standards, manufacturers that made mechanisms for different companies under different rules and white labeling, and of course, a handful of very cheap brands making very dysfunctional units that only did the job sort of right. Now. That should be the end of it for most people. The idea that folks like myself are acquiring as many players as we can and going through a whole bunch of tapes absolutely day by day, by the dozen, trying to turn them all digital before it's too late. But let's go further than that. Let's once again look at the applesauce. Here you have a miraculous piece of technology that drives a reading machine, a disk drive, whether it's an Apple disk drive or a PC disk drive or an 8-inch floppy drive. And in each case, it's basically overriding all of the controls and signals to make the drive do things, well, it's designed to do, but usually not this way to read every single magnetic flux coming out of a machine and then analyze it to truly determine what data is on there. The numbers can make you bleary-eyed, but an Apple disk, when it's read by the applesauce, produces 20 megabytes of magnetic flux information and then usually has 143K of actual data. Through the work he's done over the years, John Morris has been able to make the applesauce do breathtaking amounts of work with these magnetic flux readings to be able to fix damage, analyze protection schemes, revisit problems, and most importantly, verify that the data that is being seen is the real data and nothing is being lost. And in my dreams, in a dream that I've had, which is tangential to being asked about old VCRs or making new ones, is a dream of doing this for tape-based media. Coming up with some device, probably made using modern parts, that just works with a number of magnetic cassette-based media, reads the tape at a spectacular level of detail, and then uses software analysis to figure out what exactly is on there. And let me tell you, this technology exists. It's called VHS Decode, and in it, it actually, in some cases, requires you to solder connections by wire into the VCR to read the signal off the tape before it goes near any other part of the VCR. The VCR, in other words, is a large box which has a small mechanism in it which is experiencing override just for direct signal reading. From there, you can do all sorts of repair. Being able to see every single magnetic move on a tape allows you a massive capacity for repair. And if you're forward-thinking enough to store these incredibly large files, there's no reason that innovation and discovery along the years will allow even better readings of what's on that tape. Long after we lose the ability of magnetic heads to read files, having files to analyze will result in some truly, truly spectacular rescues of material that on the original tape just doesn't look very good. 
Imagine taking a destabilized third-generation tape of a KISS concert and then seeing it as good as HD based on the technology that you add to it after the reading. I think all of this is possible now. So why hasn't it happened in any sort of large-scale approach? Part of it is that you need a very specific type of engineer. You need somebody who understands modern techniques and has a lot of skill with them, but also can collaborate in matters of hardware manufacture and verifying that everything is working as it should. Any device that uses any sort of transport mechanism will need to have utilities and testing tools to make sure that nothing's going wrong. In fact, VCRs, which are in some ways plentiful and in other ways not at all, should be capable of being overridden and used this way, but it's pretty involved. I'm sure many people would pay hundreds of dollars for a machine that would enable them to plug a tape like a cartridge, have the machine spend a while reading all of the magnetic media off of it, and then giving you this digital intermediate that you can do all of this later analysis on. I'd buy it. You'd probably buy it. But the amount of people who will overlap all of these skill sets, who will work together to do all of it, they're very small. And it appears that none of them have picked up the gauntlet to take on the mission. The VHS Decode, also known as the LD Decode team, they are doing work. They are finding ways to read laser discs and VHS tapes and from that produce these intermediates for analysis but they're not partnering with anybody who understands hardware or comes up with kits that will allow people to do this reading. It's also clear at the moment that tapes need to be read basically in real time. While it would be wonderful to have a machine that ran through a tape at five times speed and somehow got all of the magnetic data off of it, we're not there. I feel like the standard mechanism that we use in VCRs would not be up to this task. You would have to create something from scratch. That is a very, very specific skill. Often, when I look at old media, I will find examples of specific niche equipment that does something that I want. And almost to a machine, you're talking five, ten, fifteen, or a hundred thousand dollars. They were manufactured for a very small set of specialist companies and labs. They were done as one-offs or unique consultancies. And that's it. In the world of CD-ROM reading, we have the Acronova NIMBY, which is exactly what's needed for simple reading of hundreds of CD-ROMs and DVDs without having to learn anything about soldering or software. There are programs that can drive the Acronova NIMBY, and the Acronova NIMBY does a very good job of reading these media. We don't have that for VCRs yet. We don't have it for Umatic tapes, or Sony Betacam, or Betacam, or Hi8, or Mini DV, or any of the rest. It's a gap we're living in. And meanwhile, all of these tapes are falling apart. Their magnetism is fading. We don't have much more time. So in the face of a potential perfect world coming out there, I'm just going to have to stick with a bank of VCRs, tape machines, and various professional formats, pray that they can live long enough to get my backlog of tapes, and put my dreams of that small, compact, customized reader of magnetic media back in a trunk of dreams to be let out, I hope, before it's too late. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Josiah Lucher, James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, John Sturm, Eugene, Martin, Sembiance and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt.
Make no mistake, I love it when I find out that some company created less than 500 units of a unique and wonderful machine, a true contraption of parts they were able to source, and that device, that product, sold for anywhere between 5 and 10 years before being retired because it was costing $25,000 or $50,000, only to have it show up in my collection because somebody says, maybe you're the guy for this. I sort of am the guy for this, but it's not something I rush to, because along with these beautiful machines and their unique ways of dealing with media comes all the pain of maintenance, lack of parts, lack of software support, and hoping every single day that this will not be the moment that this machine breaks. I'm much happier with a piece of commodity hardware that just gets the job done, that just makes it happen. So maybe we're going to see that with VHS tape. Maybe somebody will create a kit and they'll have a small but fun living for a few years converting sourced VHS machines into these Frankenstein devices that read things in a different way. To those people, I'll just say, I'm the first one outside the door waiting for your store to open up, and I look forward to telling people about your incredible, but as yet, uninvented product. <laughs>